So, my name is Roderick Hamilton. Today is June 13th. Time is about 7.25 p.m. Uh, the purpose of this recording is to provide the details regarding chapters 1 through 5 from our assignment and show that I have an understanding of the material that was covered. Uh, if I had to choose from one of the three classical theories to run a new company, which would I select and why? I would choose the administrative theory because uh, with that theory, it indicates that every high-level manager should have a certain uh, quality and knowledge, such as intelligence and moral qualities, and managerial ability, and uh, a certain amount of competence. Uh, with that, uh, there are multiple requirements, uh, division of work, unity of command, uh, providing employees with direction, uh, subordination of individual interest, uh, centralization and then the, sca the scalar chain, uh, which I think is important to have a chain of command so everyone knows kind of your first individual point of contact. Uh, and if you have an issue that uh, arises, then you know who you can take that issue to. Basically, it just allows you to follow the chain of command. So that would be my preference. Uh, what are my thoughts on the two articles? Um, Regarding Marissa Myers, well, she was the CEO and she's taking only two weeks maternity leave and it seems that some individuals weren't happy about it. I feel that if she thinks this is an adequate amount of time, then so be it. I mean, uh, we're looking for equality and, and this may be a little controversial, but I mean, a woman has a child, she gets six to eight weeks off. A man has a child with a woman, he gets a week off. So, I mean, in my opinion, I don't you know if that's right or wrong, but that's just that that that's typical of most organizations, at least the ones that I've been involved with. Um, and then in the second article uh, regarding the investors, I feel again that she's doing what she thinks that she needs to do in order to ensure she meets her, the obligations necessary to run that company successfully. I mean, the role as a CEO requires a certain amount of sacrifice. And in my opinion, she made it. I mean, she's at the top, so. She'll probably have to sacrifice more uh, than anyone else, and I don't think anyone should really have a problem with that. Uh, discuss the questions why humor is uh, particularly prone to create harmony or heartbreak in many organizations. I think humor can be used basically as an icebreaker, can be used to break down barriers and make others kind of feel comfortable in situations and kind of put them at ease. I mean, and it can also be used inappropriately, you know, Individuals could use, could use that in situations where they need to show a level of compassion or empathy. Uh, and so what they can do is that they'll use that humor uh, to kind of help themselves deal with the situation at hand. Uh, but it may not always be funny. Uh, knowing that increased diversity is a key element of organizational life and how can humor help? I think humor can play a role in helping different individuals find a place of common ground, which kind of helps them to relate to each other. Uh, I mean, all jokes aren't the same to everyone, but I think that can kind of help uh, you kind of find a common playing field, and it kind of helps build the relationships. How can organizational members encourage the use of humor in useful ways? I think it kind of be used as like a training technique or a tool that helps employees learn a job, maybe in a high-stressful environment. You know, it's really intense, and somebody may break the ice, and it kind of helps people feel more comfortable. So I think it could be used in training. Uh, what does symbolism have to do with how humor is perceived? According to the text, uh, understanding the relationship between these patterns and resources is key to diagnosing many organizational problems. Um, I think that speaks for itself. What is my understanding of summary system? Uh, this, the systems theory. Uh, that theory requires that you look at the big picture and understand that you're part of something bigger than yourself. You know, you have to understand that what you do is important. But basically, you're a cog in the wheel uh, of the overall organization. So, you know, what may be important to you may not be as important to someone else. But we have to, you have to have a good understanding that, you know, that you're all working together. That's my interpretation of it. And then how does, it, how does the systems theory impact today's organizations? Well, I think with organizations being as big as they are, uh, there are usually multiple departments or multiple moving parts within those groups. Uh, and those organizations, and then sometimes they're limited by boundaries, which can sometimes be self-imposed, kind of like in the example, uh, you know, someone's waiting on something, and he's waiting on something else, and, 
And so uh, I think it can, uh, it could be limitations. Uh, name an organization that we've seen in the last 12 months engage in public conflict. Wow, that's a good question. Um, I'll use the Waffle House. Uh, it's an organization that's had multiple public conflicts in the last 12 months. Um, those conflicts are, you know, the customers are going in looking for one thing and the, it looks like the employees are looking for something else and then there's a conflict because there's just a misunderstanding. Uh, and then, of course, the definition conflict is a competition kind of between interdependent parties who feel they have different needs, goals, or desires. So basically, the, the customers are going in, their desire is to have food, to pay for it. The employees, their goals are to provide you with your food and then get payment. Uh, provide you with good service, you expect good service, but sometimes there's a conflict with what is good service. Uh, define culture. In what ways does studying an organization from a cultural perspective differ from a more traditional approach? Culture is basically a set of implied rules or guidelines that are generally followed within an organization. Uh, the traditional approach, I think it's limited in scope and it doesn't really explain all the forms of behavior within an organization. Uh, and you can't really account for the vast differences amongst the organization. Now the cultural perspective, I think that one, uh, it's more fluid uh, and, it, and it's more changeable. So it's, I, I see that one as being uh, more adaptable. Uh, what are the differences between viewing an organization's culture as something <clears throat> it has versus something it is? Uh, culture as a variable perspective, I think it, it's, it involves structural things that are set in place, uh, kind of like PMPs, or, or performance appraisals, um, things like an employee handbook, you know, structural, uh, and that's set in place, uh, kind of like a guideline for employees. And then uh, the culture as root metaphor perspective kind of treats the culture as something that's implied or generally accepted in an organization. Um, and it's not really defined or structured, but it's kind of like by word of mouth. What are the most powerful symbols you've encountered in the culture at UHD? Um, and what about symbols in other organizations for which you've been a part? There are multiple symbols at UHD. I mean, I've seen one of the most common, I think, in a university are the Greek letters, which symbolize a fraternity or sorority. Uh, of course, there's the mascot, and I think the school colors are a symbol, and it's kind of uniquely different from UH Maine versus UHD. Uh, so in conclusion, I mean, the chapters that were discussed for this assignment, uh, they provided some pretty valuable insight that can be utilized for individuals who will work for organizations, likely in the future. And I think it can help us understand, you know, what a culture is and kind of help individuals assimilate themselves into an organizational culture at their potential company or organization.